Hey there, everyone. Thank you for tuning back in for the second segment of our episode centered around assessments and the cultural results that really foster a sound system of accountability. We're going to continue the conversation with our panelists as they discuss what equity truly looks like when crafting assessments for our districts and whether or not these assessments should be waived given the current learning envir environments for our students and teachers. Maria, take it away. Well, I think he just laid out what I was going to ask. So <laughs> you all take it away. <laughs> Yeah, I think one thing when we look at this student assessment and um, Texas too does have an A through F system and um, as we roll it up uh, in the state and what does that look like? Uh, we do have to have some accountability to our families uh, and to the state and to this, you know, federal, state, locally and so forth and our parents and our students. But uh, as we go and we learn and, and my part of my work is we look through like how, what other ways can we assess students with just not one test? Um, so looking at many school districts across the nation that have created these school performance frameworks. So yes, you're taking one component of that state assessment, but you're also capturing other items such as your common assessments or big benchmarks from the beginning year of the year, middle of the year, end of the year to really see where students came from. And you give yourself those points within to see growth and progress on that side of the house. Also the push for social emotional learning. You know, the voice of students doesn't just have to be a quantitative side of it. How do we get that qualitative data of the surveys of students and how they are mentally, uh, what do they need in the school? So how do we rate our students uh, using these qualitative measures? So really, can we shift to a school performance framework model to ca capture the state data? Like, can we challenge the state and say, hey, you rated us a, a C, but with our data and our matrices, that may go a little bit further than what the state's asking for. We're really a, a B school or whatever school you, whatever way you take your ratings. So, um, not just looking at one assessment, but let's capture the whole picture of that whole student. Let's look at the holistic view uh, of that model of, of a school performance framework and whatever the district seems and their needs. Because everyone said, you know, we talked about our local community. What's happening in your community? What are your needs in your community? Your assessments will differ depending on the type of students you have. Uh, in Aldine, uh, we have a high economic disadvantage number of students. We have a high at-risk number of students. So when we work with our, our population, uh, with our students, we got to make sure we're doing something different. Let's capture their success so we keep growing them from you know, the whole K-12 experience mm -hmm. and post-secondary as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really difficult question. Um, do we continue, you know, assessing, especially during this, these times? But I think one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that this pandemic happens, but we have a responsibility to our students and learning needs to continue. Um, and we need to make sure of that. And, um, and we also need to know where, where they're at in order for us to address their needs. Um, so do I think they should be assessed during these times? I, I do, I do believe that we need to know where they're at because learning needs to continue. And it didn't stop because a pandemic started. We needed to get creative and shift our thinking in ways that we were gonna continue to serve students. And um, so we need to know where they're at, whether it be through, you know, a formal assessments, informal, summative, you know, I, I think it needs to happen, whether we like it or not. It, it needs to happen. So I think one of the things too is also, I think as adults, we sort of worry a lot about, well, well, they're not ready or well, they're gonna be taking it online and how are we gonna deal with this? But one of the things that we need to just really keep in mind is that kids are resilient, that they are moldable, that they step up to the challenge that at times, I think it's the adults that struggle with that change where the kids are like, all right, well, we'll figure it out. Well, you know, we'll do it. So does, does assessment need to take place? I think absolutely. I think we need to know where they're at so we can meet them um, and we can take them, meet them where they're at and take them where they need to be. I completely agree. And um, you know, again, going back to even the word accountability, it, I thrive on that word. And, you know, just helping people get over the fact that that is a positive um, and that assessments can be a positive. I do think we need to assess and that it, it really is, um, it's an opportunity for staff and students to really bond for battle and battle to bond all at the same time. Like it gives you a target. If we're just out here, like, you know, flailing, then we're, we're the system of old. 
And without a target, how do I know what I need to do, whether I'm a teacher, a, a parent, a child, a leader? Um, that being said, it's, um, you know, the purposefulness of the assessment, I think, is where we get hung up. Our, I believe our legislator, as le legislature, looks for it in one purpose, where we are all looking at it as how do we help students with this information learn to grow, um, and how do we build our skill set to help our students. Um, but you know that's up to system leaders because that's not going to come about. I don't think from anybody else. That's our job to really provide the purposefulness of um, any kind of assessment and accountability. Um, and then you know just again. And from what Maria said, you know, kids, um, not only are they resilient, it's the adults that teach them how to become victims. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the victim mentality is just, uh, you know, it's so crippling. And our, our kids are so strong and um, they're, they're going to get through this. Yeah, they're not happy. Um, but I find that the, the students, as I just continue to stay connected, no matter what, that they know this isn't a great place, but they also know they're learning other skills and they don't want, for the most part, they don't want to be um, treated like they're not capable of getting through this pandemic and coming out stronger on the other side. Some of them can't even articulate that and that's our job to give them that hope and help them understand how powerful they really are as, as children in their own assessment and accountability. I totally agree, Gina. I think that, um... Just our, like, I think students are looking at the adults, especially right now, and they're looking to see how are the adults handling this situation. And I don't think one of the things that we realize as adults is that however we react to what's happening now is what they'll remember, yes. right? So, so it's really interesting about, and you know, when we talk to our staff, it's about this is the time to stand up and this is the time to lead, lead with, with passion, with determination, with, you know, and inspire others. Because if you channel that, the children obviously then see that and see the adults are like, you know, pretty calm about it. Hey, we're going to move forward. Yes, we need to get this done. And, and they're watching us and they're observing how we are handling this. And it's so important to just make sure we keep that in mind. Yeah, excellent points. Uh, and one thing, you know, I would love to hear to say from the, from the states, the schools, the local boards, whatnot, are we going to are we going to test yes or no? The sooner that we know, the better we can drive our instruction. Um, so we just need to know, like, are we going to do this? Let's do it. And if we do do it, how are we going to use that data? Even though the, we add the ask is, please pause, don't give us a rating. But when we get the data, we're still going to, how are we going to dissect that data? Are we going to take the data and say, well, we would have been a high performance score or we would have been a middle score. We would have been on the bottom. So although we'll still get the data, like how do we interpret it as a community, as a school, as a parent? Uh, if you say, hey, it doesn't count. We scored really high, but it doesn't, doesn't count. Or you scored low, but it doesn't count. So don't worry. So what do we do with the data once we do test with it? A minute ago, we were talking about what we place value on. And, you know, on the one hand, if, you, if, if, if it's deemed that we're going to go ahead and go with the assessment, but there's not going to be any accountability for it. You know, as a kid, it's like saying too, hey, we want you to take this test. doesn't matter, but just take it anyways. There's no value. So it's a very fine line about what is it that you're using it for? What, again, is the purpose for it? And so, you know, a, a free pass? Well, I don't know about you, but somebody tells me a free pass, woohoo, mm -hmm. I'm out. I put no value, it's my time. And so, you know, it's gonna be interesting. Absolutely right. It's gonna be very interesting because to all of your points, um, our kids knowing what they need uh, is gonna be um, cr not only critical, but we already have data that uh, we talked about, I think on an, an earlier show where, you know, we have had trauma for different kinds of environmental issues from Katrina, you know, in Puerto Rico for Maria, and we've been gathering data on the academic as well as the social emotional pieces. And what we're finding is even from Katrina, you know, that it, it 15 years later, 15 years later, 
these kids that have been followed through have been very, very impacted by that. So knowing that, because that's data, what are we gonna do right here, right now with our kids to make sure 15 years later, we're not just repeating a trend. Mm. And so that leads me to this next question. If we say that assessments are to inform and we have all kinds of gaps from across the board with our kids, what does equity look like in a culture of results? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, when we talk about that equity of results, um, I look at through the lens with equ equity and excellence. How do we grow everybody and keep everybody moving forward? Even if you're growing um, from a, the lowest quartile to the next quartile or up, but even the students who are at the top, we still got to continue to grow them as well. So that equity lens is always one discussion. But when you say equity and excellence, like how do we make it all inclusive for everybody to keep moving in that direction? Um, I can't say what, I can't tell you, if I had that answer, you, you would read my book everywhere, but we just don't have it yet. I, I just can't <laughs> how we move that, that piece. But, you know, part of the system is we're going to keep growing and learning. Uh, and what might be equitable to one person in one lens is not in another. So that, that key component of excellence is, yes, we have to assist everybody in this work. Everybody needs to have that equi equitable uh, approach to it, but let's keep growing all students. Let's make everybody towards that excellence movement. So equity, I can't say by itself, it stands alone. It has to be equity and excellence for all our students to drive that culture of results. To so really say, yes, we're moving all students, uh, no matter where you're from, no matter what zip code you live in, everybody's growing. I totally agree with you, Adrian. And I love the fact that you bring up excellence. Um, our vision state statement is uh, igniting the road to excellence, and that's what and that's what we strive to do, you know, in our school district and and in our community. And I think one of the things that when I think about equity and I look at, you know, in my you know in my community in the community that I grew up in, and one of the things that I think is extremely important when we're talking about equity is I think of exposure. What are we going to expose our kids? that other kids in more affluent areas are exposed to because they deserve that. So um, I always think about how can we, you know, what can we strive to do as a team? What can we come, what can, what do we currently have in place? So it's all about assessing what you have, what's impactful in student learning and hey, what is not, let's get rid of it. And let's use the funds that we have to get the return on investment for our children to bring those programs, to bring STEAM, to bring underwater robotics, to bring, you know, all these innovative programs into our school district so that we are able to, you know, to level out the playing field for, for our students. And there's nothing more powerful than to see a students in a community like ours compete in those, you know, in those uh, competitions with students that, you know, are, are in more affluent areas well, you know what? No, we've leveled out the playing field. We are, it's our responsibility as educators and as instructional leaders and as leaders of districts to ensure that we're looking at our budgets, that we're using our title funds efficiently, that we are analyzing everything that we're doing and we don't go from being, you know, just checking something off the list. Okay, we're doing that, we're doing that. Well, it goes beyond that. It's how are we bringing programs to our district to make sure that our students are exposed to what they deserve. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, that ignites that road to excellence that then make sure that our students are going to the places that they're dreaming of. Thank you for that. Thank you for um, underscoring what Gina talked about. You know, it's, we're not doing check because that's, mm -hmm. that's fostering compliance. And mm -hmm. compliance is not excellent. Gina, mm -hmm. what we're going to do now is um, we're going to get ready to wrap up. But before we do that, I want to give each of you an opportunity just to share, you know, your thoughts when it comes to, you know, accountability. Because we talk about assessments and, and, and you know, we can define that um, in, a, in, a, in various ways. But when it comes to accountability, the word accountability, Gina, you said it's not a dirty word. 
then what kind of a word is accountability and to whom? And if you can answer that and just share kind of, you know, your, your whole wrap up your own piece about assessment and accountability, we'll wrap this segment up. Okay, I'll try to do that. And you correct me if I don't. Um, so, so for me, accountability um, goes hand in hand with being authentic. And that's what makes it not a dirty word. <laughs> um, it is the spirit of the accountability and, and how you're using it in a system that makes it so impactful and how you're going to use whatever data set where you're talking about at that in that moment or that snapshot um, and what your why is. So for us in Yuma Union High School District, every student will be college career and community prepared upon graduation. That's our, that's our end game. Um, we have taken out honors courses. We don't have weighted grades except for advanced placement so that students can really be authentic in their pathway choice that I don't get penalized for taking band or um, auto automotive or culinary and get um, you know, a, an add a girl for taking AP whatever and honors whatever, which is really just a way to segregate um, you know, people from one another. Mm -hmm. But I think that's what makes it different. And that, that is that authentic piece about you really are about every student because every student has the same opportunity and that's how students learn to access and voice and, and make choice. You only have choice if you know how to access the choice. Mm -hmm. And I, I go back to that's my accountability piece and that's how we keep it authentic here. Awesome, Gina, that's, that's great. You know, I think accountability in my lens drives student outcomes because with that accountability, whatever we get from our, our numbers, if we just look strictly at numbers, what do we do with it? How can we create an unparalleled, like this type of education will give us those choices and opportunities for our students today and in the future. So I really use a lens of the innovation. Our accountability is gonna drive what's gonna happen at all schools. If you're a top rated school, great, you're still gonna get this innovation. If you're a middle tier school, you're still gonna get some type of innovation. So when I look at accountability, I always try to say, let's find the strength of this. What's the silver lining from this accountability so we can do things differently, how to reimagine it. So students still have that high quality instruction, no matter where they're at. So. You know, in our district, our mission is to really provide a rigorous and enriching educational experience that provides every student for success, college, career, and life. And I really feel in all being in my role, like that accounting measure, we get these results. You may get money, you may not get money, but that doesn't should make the difference. We got to do what's right for students. And that is just to innovate them to have positive student outcomes uh, across the district. So I agree, accountability is not really, it's not a bad word but it's the lens we use it to help drive what's next for our students. I totally agree. When I think of accountability, I just think it's like our shared responsibility of what we are going to do. What are you going to do? What is your part, right? Of, of whatever, um, in whatever lens we're looking at it, whether you're looking at a classroom level, building level or district level, you know, what are we going to do to take our kids where we need to be? And it's our responsibility to make sure that, that we abide by whatever it is that we're doing, whether it's our strategic planning that, we, uh, that we're that we putting together or our school improvement plan, or whether you're goal setting with your students or goal setting with your teachers, or, you know, or even to the point of the student levels, right? Whether we're, um, they're having, you know, student-led conferences and they're guiding the discussion with their parents. Like, how is everyone being held accountable? It's not about one person. It's not about what the superintendent is doing, the assistant soup. No, it's about how we're doing collectively, right? And, and everyone is held accountable in this game. It's not just about one person, what one person's doing. It's about everyone and how we're gonna move forward to ensure we are doing what's right for our students. Well, folks, you know, you have been amazing, amazing participants in this conversation. And to those of you who get to listen to this or watch this or watch and listen to this, um, know that these are three of some of our nation's mover and shakers. And with that, mm -hmm. Alas thanks you. Keep doing the good work because we're out here cheering you on just like mm -hmm. Maria's doing in her district. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Maria. Thank you for hosting this. We appreciate it.
Thank you. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Good. I'm so glad. <laughs> Hey there, and don't forget, if you like what you hear and want to gain some more insight into what school districts are facing now, then tune in every Thursday at 7 p.m. or subscribe below. We thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great night.